Greetings to each one this morning, the Savior's precious name. Welcome each one to our worship hour. Trust we have been and will continue to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This morning, Brother Devon, in the opening meditational, the first couple of verses there in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I won't curse the ground anymore. So what do we see in those verses? We see that Noah did a sacrifice. And it smelled good to God. This morning I would like to say that each one of us. I trust that our lives are a living sacrifice before God. So I ask the question. The burning question for each one of us this morning is simply. Is my life and the sacrifices of my life a sweet smelling savor before God? I titled the message. Abominations or delights of God. Each one of us here this morning, our lives are naked and open before the eyes of him of whom we have to do. And we heard that in Sunday school this morning as well. There's no secrets. Even though Saul disguised himself to go to the witch of Endor, God knew exactly what was happening. There was nothing hidden. And what Saul did there was an abomination before God. Going to a witch for help. <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5, it speaks of a man, Enoch, was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony. What was that testimony that Enoch had? He pleased God. Amen. So the bottom line this morning, is my life pleasing God? The sacrifices, the fruits of my life, are they pleasing to God? Or is it an abomination? And you're going to say, wait a minute here. Um, maybe it's neither. Maybe it's not really that pleasing, but it's not really an abomination either. I ask you the question, is that possible? No. My dear friends, this morning, either my life is pleasing to God, or my life is an abomination before him. We tend to cloud the lines. And we tend to condone some things that God does not condone. And we call it all right. When it really isn't. So this morning, the, the theme throughout the whole message, we're going we're gonna to be looking at both sides. And I know I tend to often focus probably a little too much on the dark side. On the, the abominations, you might say. On the things that God does not bless him and please him. The things that are a, a, an abomination before his sight. I, I tend to, to focus on those things. But this morning, with the Lord's help, I want to also focus on the things that God delights in. Those things that are pleasing before God. You know, there, I don't believe there's a one of us here that in our relationships... Number one, we have, should have a relationship with God that we defend and that we have a lot of effort that we put into so that our relationship can be such as can be pleasing to God. How many marriages does the wife not desire to be a delight to her husband? And how many husbands don't desire to be the delight of their wives. 
it's a good desire and it's a true desire that, that we seek that. And there's fulfillment in being pleasing to each other, right? Right and good, and it should be. Courtship. <clears throat> there's that thing that's always behind courtship is we would desire to be pleasing to our partner because... We have something in mind for the future, Lord willing. Even when they play a game and get a little uh, aggravated at each other, right? I don't even know where Crystal is at. She ran away. They desire to delight each other. And we saw that very definitely played out last night. It is not wrong. It is good. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 24 it says, But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. What? What does the Lord delight in this morning? It is those three things. And I think that those three things are pretty well the, the full spectrum of the things that God delights in. Number one is loving kindness. Loving kindness, what is that? It is affectionate, compassion, and caring deeds. Compassionate and caring deeds. You know, when we look at the, our lives, and we look at relationships, and we look at, at desiring to please, it has a lot to do with affection, with loving kindness. When we love to bless others with loving kindness, it brings delight in our lives, does it not? When loving kindness flows freely among us, it is a delight to each other, but I would like to say most of all a delight. When God looks down upon his people and he sees loving kindness and affection one for another. Justice. Judgment is justice. Fairness. True and right dealings. You know, sometimes that's where it, the test comes on. Sometimes we, we allow loving kindness to override justice. When our emotions desire to bless each other to the point of not being fair and correct and true to what is right and wrong. And then righteousness, simple Virtuous, moral, holy living. Those three things are the criteria that God looks down upon our lives. And he's measuring every word, every deed. Whether it measures into this loving kindness, this judgment, and this righteousness that God desires of his children. So as we go through the message today, let's, let's think about those three things. Is it loving and kind? Is it true and right and fair? And is it righteous and holy? <clears throat> Proverbs 15, verse 8, it says, The sacrifices of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. We had in that text in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, that Devon read this morning, that the sacrifice was pleasing, and he, God had a delight in that sacrifice. Noah was a man that feared God. And what is one of the primary things that Noah is known for? Was it not for the obedience of doing that which God commanded him even though it didn't make sense? And you know, my dear friends, this morning, if we want to have sacrifices that are pleasing to God, sometimes it maybe doesn't all make sense. But all God asks of us is simple obedience. That we know what, that we do what we know is right. 
Sometimes we may not always know exactly, Lord, what is right. But if we live in what we know is right, God will continue to reveal and to build us up step by step, allowing his will to be perfected in our lives. But the wicked is an abomination. His sacrifices are an abomination. There are many things that the wicked do that are not right with God. They are against God. And, and, we, and like the Sunday school, the rebellion of Saul is what led to his downfall. The disobedience led to Saul's downfall. He decided to go on and sacrifice without waiting on Samuel when he was strictly told, just wait on Samuel. But God, I don't understand. It's time. The enemy's out here. and We need to get this done. And he thought, you know, in his mind, mentally, it just made sense to move forward. But God had said through Samuel, wait till Samuel gets there. Simple obedience. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. <coughs> sacrifice is our worship. But a sacrifice is more the external worship. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. The sacrifice of, of going to church and not having my life right with God. The sacrifice of praying and having my life not right with God. Worshiping God with lip service but our hearts being far from Him. Those are an abomination before God. But the prayer of the upright. You know, here a while back, we had a, on our sign, there's, it said something about, do you pray your prayers or say your prayers? I think something to that effect. And you know, if we don't have a relationship with God, we soon find ourselves saying our prayers, don't we? But when we have a relationship with God, we pray our prayers. And the prayer of the upright is his delight. He loves to hear his children pray to him. Why? It expresses confidence in Almighty God. It expresses that we love to be his children. It expresses that we have faith that he will do what is right. And even amidst these, these, like the kidnapping in Haiti, we don't have a whole lot other we can do except pray, do we? But that is a mighty hand, mighty tool in the hand of God. That when we pray, that we lift up these dear friends that we don't even know maybe, but friends in the gospel, friends of Christ, our fellow Christians that are in bondage, that we pray, and it is a delight to God to hear his people come to him. Just, for, just a form or from the heart. <clears throat> if we pray and our heart is not right with God, we can go to church, go to Bible school, go to revival meetings, share glowing testimonies, even testify to others, and not be doing it from the heart, but for eye service is a sacrifice that is not pleasing to God. It is an abomination before God when we have a profession of God in us but deny the power thereof. An abomination. Often those who are focused on the externals and the show of being a Christian witness without the true relationship with God look down on those who have a relationship with God and maybe little outward show of words and witnessing. I believe that is something we need to be careful with. That we are not judgmental in our attitudes because my brother or my sister do not witness and testify the way I think we should. I think it would be better to go out here and go to the Kansas City missions and we need to do this and we need to do that. And I think it's all right and good and I think we should. But when we begin to be judgmental toward each other because he or she doesn't witness the way I think we should. We don't know what their life may be doing. We don't know what other methods of witnessing that they may have that they are doing that might not be so showy. Maybe they are that prayer warrior. And there's many other ways. There's diversity. God uses diversity of expression for the building of the kingdom. But the diversity must come under these three attributes, loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. Some may be missionaries and some may support missionaries. Some may excel in witnessing the strangers, and others may excel in teaching Sunday school. Some may excel in helping their neighbors, and others may excel in foreign disaster relief. 
And the list could go on. God delights in those who are busy in his kingdom. I don't want to mitigate the, the importance of being a builder in the kingdom of God. But my dear friends, there's different ways of doing that. We're not all called to the same calling. We're not all called to the same profession. And when we are a blessing, when we bless others, even though we may not know what the brother or the sister is doing in the kingdom of God, like we often think we should see or know. God doesn't only delight in what I might feel is most important, but we must delight in others who may have different callings, but God delights in them as well. <clears throat> so I like to dissect a little bit what is an abomination and what is a delight. An abomination is something that is a disgrace. It is repulsive, detestable, vile. We just call it just plain horrible. What are some of those things in the natural? So that we kind of get in a, when God says it's abominable, <clears throat> what is he what are some things that we, as humans, can relate to? Ever, would you desire to take a bath in sewer water? No. That would be an abomination. What about eating moldy bread or biting into a rotten apple with a worm in it? Urgh, it's an abomination. Talking face to face with someone who has bad breath. Or crawling into a motel bed to find hair in it. Those things are repulsive. So let's remember how repulsive abomination, that word abomination, that's what that means. That's how God looks upon some of these things that we're going to touch on today. So what is a delight? Well, we'd say the total opposite, and that's true. Something we appreciate, take pleasure in. We enjoy it, and it makes us happy. Those are delight. So what are some natural examples of that? The morning cup of hot coffee. Fresh, hot, Krispy Kreme donuts. Juicy sirloin steaks. Medium rare, that is. Taking a good hot shower. Every Thursday night, crawling into a bed that's just been clean, washed clean that day. Cold glass of iced tea. Refreshing. It's a delight. God either delights or is repulsed by my life. And you and I have the key to whether of those two it is. Proverbs 11, 20 says, They that are of a forward heart are abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. Forward and upright. Forward. What does that mean? Webster says, habitually disposed to disobedience and opposition. So, are we saying that opposition isn't good? Shouldn't we be opposed to some of these things? I think we should. But my dear friends, there's a difference in how we oppose something too. Makes me think of, I think I maybe shared it last Sunday in Sunday school. About this man down in Seymour that was so antagonistic. Opposition. He had opposition against everything and anything. That's all he preached and all he taught was in opposition to everything. And he failed to preach about what he delights in. The froward will 
be stubborn, habitually disposed to disobedience and opposition, rash, headstrong. <clears throat> the opposite is the child of God should be submissive, meek, flexible, and followers of good, and teachers of good things. That's the opposite. <coughs> How did they deal with a person like this in the Old Testament? Uh, Jeffrey or Jesse or any of the other children. Can any of you tell me what happened to a boy in the Old Testament that disobeyed his parents and was not willing to obey them? Anyone know? If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, spanked him, and he still won't listen, then shall his father and mother lay hold on him and do what? Huh? Stone him. Wow, how many of us would be alive today if that would have happened to us? If we, when we disobeyed our parents, how many of us would still be alive today? Probably none of us. We've all had our share of that, have we not? But do we see the importance of how God looks at stubbornness and rebellion and disobedience? They were to bring him to the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of the city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious and he won't obey our voice. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones. Just like Jeffrey said. It is an abomination before God for disobedience. To anyone in our authority. Who all is our authority? And we all vary. Some have different people for different authority. But we all are under authority. It is an abomination to God if we have a froward heart and fail to obey. Just like Saul again, Samuel came to him and said, As the Lord is great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, said, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken to the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as, is in that, as iniquity and idolatry. And I find it interesting this morning that the Sunday school lesson that we had this morning, where did Saul go to? To the witch. Witch of Endor. And Samuel had prophesied to him long before this that stubbornness and idolatry is like the sin of witchcraft. And that's exactly where Saul went to. Stubbornness and rebellion is an abomination before God. It will take us further than we want to go. It is a chain and a bondage that will bind us. And as we grow older and older, if we fail to submit and obey our parents as young children, it will be a hardship and a band that must be broken by the powers of God later in life. And the longer we wait, the, longer, the harder it will be. But it is not just about children here this morning. It's about each one of us that we learn to obey the will of God. That we learn to obey and submit to our authority. <clears throat> Proverbs 11 verse 1 says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So what's a false balance this morning? It is says it's an abomination before God, and I believe a false balance is when we use deceit to take advantage of someone. When we, you might say, have unjust weights, and we jip people, or we take advantage 
of those who may not know that they are being taken advantage of. Also, it mitigates against the great, the second greatest commandment, which is, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How can you love your neighbor as yourself when you're taking advantage of them? When you have a false balance? When you rip them off, per se? No man can rob his brother without wronging his own soul. Just recently, we ran out of Krypton gas to fill gas between our glass in our windows. We also have argon gas, but some people pay extra for Krypton gas because it insulates better in a triple pane window than argon. And we were in the middle of a batch of glass. We ran out of Krypton. What do we do? We could have put argon in the rest of those windows and the customer would have never known the difference. And it actually would have put a little bit more money in my pocket. I couldn't help the Krypton cylinder ran out right then. We don't have another one. It's going to take a long time before we get one. And then we call and we ask how, how soon we could get Krypton and what the price is. And instead of a cylinder being $8,000, it's now $35,000 for one cylinder of gas. I said, well, oh, I didn't know this. We can't do this. So I'll for sure just put argon in. Called the customer. Asked them what they want us to do, that we could fill the rest of them with argon and lower the price to the argon price. Or if they want to wait on Krypton, we don't know. It's unaffordable at this time. And it's hard to get, too. They said, we paid for Krypton, and we're going to have Krypton. There we were. Well, God help us, helped us work it out, and we borrowed some Krypton from another friend, and we got that job out. Well, if it's not out the door, it's going out the door soon. But some of those things, it would be so easy to use a false balance. But my dear friends, it is an abomination before God. Deuteronomy 25, 13, Thou shalt not have in thy bag divers weights, great and small. Thou shalt not have in thy house divers measures, great and small. Thou shalt have a perfect and a just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. You might say so that we can have God's blessing upon our lives, so that God will delight in us. For all that do such things, and all that do unrighteously, are an abomination unto the Lord our God. Just plain words. Building metal buildings, using number two, pretending it's number one. What about selling Amish cheese? What about selling hay as A1 when it's been rained on? What about selling beef calves as long time weaned? When we say at least 24 hours seems a long time to me. Unless you go on. Proverbs 15, 26 for another one. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. The difference here is the thoughts of the wicked and the words of the pure. How, how does that correlate with each other? Well, simple. Our thoughts turn into words, don't they? The wicked's words are not loving kindness. The wicked's words will bite, but the words of the pure are pleasant words, words that build, words that bless, words that encourage. What are my words this morning? First of all, what are my thoughts toward my brother and my sister, toward others? Thoughts turn into words and actions. 
As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Evil thoughts turn to evil words, and it's an abomination to God. <clears throat> thoughts of covetousness, desiring and grasping for things others have, envy, bitter jealousy, and grudges towards someone who has an advantage that we may not have, lust, wanton desires and passions, hatred, detesting, angry, dislike, and grudges, and pride. I have a little more of that later. <clears throat> Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, what's everything are pure? What's everything are true? What's everything are honest? What's everything are of good report? What's everything are lovely? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, it says, think on these things. So if we want the praise of God, think on things that are heavenly. And our virtues and our life will be heavenly in a blessing before God. <coughs> Next one is Proverbs 17, verse 15. It says, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are an abomination to the Lord. He that justifieth the wicked. That simply means that if we condone sin and bless those who are sinning, we are guilty of it as well, and we're an abomination before God. We are not to bless the wicked in their sin, but bless them by admonition of their wickedness. And he that condemneth the just is just as wrong. If we condemn those that are living according to the will of God, it is an abomination before God. Condoning, accepting, or blessing a sinner versus condemning a saint. Both are an abomination. So how might we be guilty of justifying the sinner? When our social love exceeds spiritual love. When our love is focused on the here and now rather than eternity. It is hard for us and it should be hard for us to admonish a sinner. But if we fail to take a stand against sin, we are helping a sinner on the way to hell and bring a condemnation upon our own lives. You know, where that hits home the hardest is when it comes into family. <laughs> Exodus 23, verse 7 says, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and the righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. <clears throat> Proverbs 6 16 to 19, a portion that we often hear. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. I thought to digest each one of these yet. Time is moving rapidly. Just maybe briefly touching on each one of these. A proud look is an abomination to God. What's a proud look? Pride of personal appearance. Elegance of figure. Beauty of face. Masculine strength. In Psalm 147, verse 10, it says, He delighteth not in the strength of the horse, and he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. How about Jesus? How many of you think he went to the gym every morning and lifted weights and put on his tight-fitting shirt and made sure everybody could see his muscles and I 
Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root of a dry ground. Dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Doesn't sound like that kind of a person, does it? So does that mean that we should then look just as comely as we can? Unkept. Strublich. Just any old way. Dirty. No. I believe it simply means that our life is to glorify God, but not ourselves. Is my life glorifying God? Or would I rather wear those tight-fitted shirts to display my muscles? Or have hairdos that fit the trend? Or have my dress cut in a way to reveal? Or fingernails and toes that, toenails that need to be polished? I'll just tell you, I'll be open and frank. I've seen and heard of some of this coming to our circles. And I think it's an abomination before God. Pride of ability, intellectual force, knowledge, eloquence. We must remember that in John 5, thir verse 30, it says, Of my own self, I can do nothing. Deuteronomy 8, verse 16, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna when thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end? And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. And thou remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore in his fathers as is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify again unto you this day that ye shall surely perish. It is an abomination when we take credit for our own accomplishments. It is God that gives us these things. We can have pride of social prominence, pride of reputation, superiority, pride of will. Maybe we remember about all the good things we've done for God. Let's remember that who was it in Matthew there where, where it says that when saw we thee and hungered? When saw we thee a thirst? When saw thee we in prison and came unto thee? They, they didn't even remember that they did those things. They did it to glorify God and others, not for their own count, not counting for their own merits. But those that were an abomination before God, they recalled all the good things they did. They recalled how many people they baptized. They recalled how many people they saved and brought to the Lord. They recalled all those things. My dear friends, this morning, pride will keep track of what we've done for God. I've been a preacher for how many years? I've done this and I've, I've preached there and I've, I've gone to Iraq and I've gone here and there and I've done all these things. But we can't get away from remembering some of the things we've done. I, I understand. But we dare not put any stock in it. We're no better than anyone else. The Lord resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. The man in whom the proud spirit dwells stands far from the salvation of God. All right. A lying tongue is an abomination. We don't think that takes a lot of... If we lie, it's an abomination. Children, when you lie to your parents to try to get out of something, God hates it. And as you grow older, one lie, it takes another one to cover for that one. God hates lying. And a half-truth is a full lie. A deliberate intent to deceive is a lie, even when it sounds right. And we could go to Ananias and Sapphira. <clears throat> a man buying a horse asked the seller if this was a good horse, and the seller said yes. Why are you selling him, asked the buyer. The seller replied, because I am poor, and he eats too much. Hmm. Does he have any other bad habits, inquired the buyer? No, replied the seller, except he doesn't climb trees. Hmm. But when after purchasing the horse, the buyer was leading him home, 
and the horse, it bit everybody that came close. The buyer said, Is it, it's true what he told me. He does eat too much. Then he came to a wooden bridge, and the horse refused to cross. The people seeing this said, Truly, he doesn't climb trees. See the insinuation and what was real? How often do I have the best while I'm trying to sell it? But I don't tell everything. But they never ask me about that. It's easy to do. The minister wound up the service one morning by saying, next Sunday I'm going to preach on the subject of liars. And in this connection, as a preparation for my discourse, I should like for all of you to read 17th chapter of Mark. Well, we could probably, I'd say most of us older folks have probably all read the Bible through several times. So we can say, well, we've read Mark 17, right? On the following Sunday, the preacher rose to begin and said, now... All of you who have done as I requested and read the 17th of chapter of Mark, please raise your hands. Nearly every hand in the congregation went up. Then, said the preacher, you are the very people I want to talk to because there is no Mark 17. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Hands that shed innocent blood. We already touched on that. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift and running to mischief. A false witness. And one who sows discord among the brethren. Sowing discord among the brethren is the seventh thing. And I believe this morning that it is something that is a tremendous abomination before God. When he sees brothers and sisters sowing discord... In the church of Jesus Christ, his bride. What is sowing discord? It is any who, by lies and misinterpretations, strive to make men's minds evil affected towards their brethren. Discord, deliberate and wanton disturbance of previous harmony and causing dissensions. Jesus said... Blessed are the peacemakers. His delight is in peacemaking, not pieces making. And in Proverbs 3.12, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Even as a father in whom he delighteth. He delights in us. That's why he corrects us betimes. You know, there's none of us here that don't need a little correction every now and then. May we count it as a blessing when God reaches down and corrects us. You know why he does it? Because he delights in us. Just like you children. You think your mom and dad like you when they spank you. Huh? They do? That's how you know they love you is because they correct you, right? Yeah. That's the same way for us as older people. God still does that to us. All right, in closing, Isaiah 62, verse 1 says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof is a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, 
and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Who's he talking about? For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake will I not rest. Who's he talking about? The church. The church of Jesus Christ. My dear friends, this morning, the church of Jesus Christ, it says, my delight is in her. God delights in his church. What a blessing it is that we as dust of the earth can be accounted as part of a church that God delights in. We are unworthy of this. But my dear friends, this morning I trust we're rejoicing that we can be a part of this glorious body, the church of Jesus Christ. For the Lord delighteth in thee. Praise God. Ephesians 5, 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the what? The church. He nourisheth and cherisheth the church. His love and his blessing is on the church of Jesus Christ. Are we thankful that we can be a part of his bride? Because he's coming again at the end of life for what? The church. Numbers 14, verse 8. If the Lord delight in us, if the Lord delight in his church, and we are a part of the church, then he will bring us unto this land. And give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. My dear friends, that's eternity in heaven for you and I. Shall we kneel for a word of prayer? Dear Lord, as we bow in your presence here this morning's hour, grateful to you again, Lord, for your many blessings to us this day. Lord, we thank you for your word that teaches us and admonishes us of things that are right and things that are wrong. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we pray that we could allow it to mold us and shape us so that we can be a sweet-smelling savor before thee, so that your delight can be upon us, and that we would not do things that bring us into a setting of being an abomination before you. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us where we have done these abominations, where we have come short of doing your will, and Lord, we pray that we could truly live our lives a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, and that we can be a blessing one to another and a blessing your kingdom. And also, Lord, we thank you for the church. Your delight is in her. And Lord, that we can be a part of this glorious body. And Lord, that we can all be together, rejoicing with you for all eternity. Bless us, give us courage, give us strength, give us grace as we face the battles of life, that we can be victorious that we can be a blessing for you and your kingdom. Lord, at this moment, we pray again for the captives in Haiti. Pray thy grace, thy comfort, thy courage be with them. We pray that you would supply for their natural needs. We pray that you would supply for their spiritual needs and even emotional needs. Lord, we lift them to you. We pray thy divine guidance, protection, and blessing be upon each one. And Lord, our cry and our plea is for deliverance. We pray for those who have taken them captive. We pray that the testimony of Jesus Christ could be so real in the lives of these captives that it would melt their hearts and draw them to thee. We just commit our lives into your hand. Bless us and keep us in Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'd like to open up for testimony at this time.